Hi, this is Phil Newman from Longevity Technology, and I'm talking to you today from the Wonderland Conference in Miami, and I'm joined by the President and CEO of the Buck Institute, Eric Vadin, MD. Eric, how are you? Very good. Good to see you, Phil. Yeah, and Eric, we've uh, we've been on the circuit a few times and, and uh, connected with each other. And I, I remember at your presentation in uh, Gestat, you were talking in, in great depth about your your kind of concerns about some of the language that's being used in the longevity industry now. And of course, you know, human health span is probably a maximum of 125 years at this stage. But obviously, people are talking about things in a much greater uh, ambitious way now. And I guess you have some concerns about that. Is that correct? Yeah, and uh, and I feel, you know, frankly, I feel somewhat as we, we've chatted. I feel a bit ambivalent about, you know, sounding like the the, the big grumpy old man of, of of aging research or sort of a naysayer and killing people's hope. And and that's not my intention. I I mean, there are a few people who are more excited about what um, where this field is going, the acceleration of the research. Um, but I, I also feel that um, we're sort of getting getting ahead of our skis a little bit by some of the the statements. I mean, first I'll, I'll tell you a word about immortality. You know, th that word has unfortunately come back. Uh, don't die. You know, all all of these statements, in my opinion, are completely out of out of place in a scientific discourse. I mean, we are not working on immortality. I, I frankly, it's never going to happen. Um, there's no evidence whatsoever that it will ever happen. And I'm, I'm, I'll question whether this is even desirable. But so that that's really, let's put immortality and the immortalist completely on the side. Just irrealistic, never going to happen. Um, but then there's a whole group of, of our colleagues who actually are, are talking about things that are that seem attainable, sort of a 150-year lifespan or... Uh, others, you know, some some that are selling supplements are talking about a 180 year lifespan, and even that, frankly, is in my opinion, is completely uh, premature, and it doesn't help us. It's sure it creates hopes, it creates clicks, uh, it sells books, uh, it might sell supplements, but it also is a, frankly, it, it's a distraction. It just uh, it also alien, alienates us from a whole group of people who are serious about biomedical research and it makes us sound like a snake oil sale, salesman. So, uh, you know, one, one of the things that we've talked about is the fact that I've I've compared our industry, the biotech industry that's dealing with longevity with um, the space in the, the commercial space industry. And when you look at what they're hoping to do is going to the moon, going to Mars, uh, which are amazing, would be amazing feat if a commercial company could do this. And, and my prediction is that they will attain these goals. Uh, but you will also notice that they're not talking about uh, interstellar travel. Uh, you know, interstellar travel, everyone's dreaming about this, but uh, it, it's been recognized that we would need to be able to travel at the speed of light. Uh, to be able to do this. And we're very far from this. And the same goes about living to 150, living to 180. Uh, will we ever ever able to be able to do this? Sure. If I had to bet, I would say yes. But will it be in 20 years? Uh, probably not. Will it be in 100 years? Probably not. Most likely not. And really? so that's very that's very interesting, Eric. So so you're you're getting a feel for the trajectory of the science and the reality of what we're dealing with as a as a as a clinical community, as a scientific community, as well as society. Yes, yes. And I think, you know, so here's the arguments that are being brought for this is, you know, first, I've been told you're not optimistic enough and, and you're sort of a naysayers and you don't have you don't. I mean, at first, I want to say I understand how the science is going, probably equally well to anybody in the field. I mean, I'm, I'm sitting in a position where I see the science not only at the back, but across the world. I know what we can do in mice. And, and it's amazing. But there's a whole series of things. And people will tell you, well, you don't understand science is accelerating. And look at the Moore's law, what happened with the telephones and so on. Um, well, first, we don't have a Moore's law in biology. Uh, that, that's If you look at the increase of lifespan in humans over the last 150 years, it's been about two decades, two, two years every decade. So we gain, you know, lives, two years of lifespan every decade. 
and it's not been accelerating. Actually, in the US, it's, it's strongly decelerating. So that, that's the number one fact. There's no evidence of an acceleration of the process. And the reason for this, I think, is the science is accelerating. That's definitely true. But the problems that we're trying to solve are getting harder and harder because we're getting closer and closer to a biological limit uh, for human lifespan, which right now is probably 100, 150 years, uh, maybe 120 uh, in between those two. So that's to me is really the variable that most people fail to understand. Uh, acceleration of science, but problems that are getting harder and harder to solve. So that being said, I think, you know, thinking about most of us living to 100 in good health is doable. So, and this is what is not being discussed enough because that transformation, imagine that we would gain all of a sudden 25 years of lifespan today would actually be transforming society on a scale that we cannot barely imagine. And so, 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 so really, you're, you're talking really about more bringing, bring, bringing things down to a more realistic level and, and really working on health span. Exactly. And actually, but, but also lifespan. I mean, right now, life expectancy in the U.S. is 76, <laughs> uh, which is lagging behind, you know, most places in the world, the Western world, where it's around 80, 82 um, so it, it's it's a bit paradoxical that we're talking about 150 year lifespan while actually life expectancy is decreasing. And it sort of obscures all of the important things that could be done today and that our, where our field could actually really contribute. So for me, from my perspective, if we want to be taken seriously by the medical world, by the way, which is going to be critical uh, in, uh, you know, in bringing this revolution to patients, uh, I think it'd be great for us to start making these crazy statements and actually get to work with them to actually implement much of what we know today and really make a difference in people's lives. You know, we can talk about, about living to 150 until we're blue in, in the face, um, but we're not going to deliver this anytime soon. And at some point, people are going to look back and saying, well, you were making, the, you know, some of us, some of our colleagues were talking about a 1,000 year lifespan 20 years ago. Uh, and I don't want to name names, but there are several people who were doing this. They're not doing this anymore because now we have the recordings from 20 years ago and that people show me and says, you know, this is what your field was claiming you were going to deliver. So what are you saying now? Well, we've scaled it down to 150. That doesn't make us look very serious. And my, my argument is, I think the the, the longevity revolution has the potential to transform healthcare and, and our lives, frankly. Uh, let's get to work under promise and then over deliver and not do the opposite. Because my prediction is that there will be a backlash. And frankly, that backlash already exists uh, within the medical community where we are not taken seriously. Uh, because and do, do you feel that's the case, Eric? Are, are you finding that in the interactions that you're having outside of the, the longevity community with other organizations and other societies around the world that they still look at longevity as as not real, as not a genuine area of science? Or are you seeing that people are taking it more seriously and therefore questioning more deeply some of the claims that are now being made? Uh, I think it, it creates the perception of us as a fringe movement. Uh, and I'll, I'll tell you the two groups in which I see this clearly is the medical world. Uh, if you have friends that are physician, uh, tell them about what we're trying to do. And you know, most people will actually raise their eyes in the sky saying, yes, uh, let's all take resveratrol and we're all going to live forever. Um, the, that's one, one area. And I, I've claimed you know, that we will not implement this revolution without the help of physicians, without working with them, understanding what, what it's like to actually work with a patient. Uh, or you know, pharma industry is another one. You know, pharma, you know, for all the promise of aging research, you would have thought that, that we are also excited about, you would have thought that pharma would have jumped in this. They haven't. Uh, they're sort of looking at it as, you know, with some degree of, of skepticism and, fr and frankly, sometimes hostility. And the last group is the, all the VCs. You know, name me um, five major VC companies who, by the way, have an eye for really detecting the best opportunities that are involved in the aging space. Uh, there are some that are sort of dipping their toes, but when you talk to them, actually quite often they will make the same point. 
seems to be a lot of hype in this field, a lot of snake oil, and just, you know, some serious people, but drowned by a noise of crazy claims, basically. And I think to me, I see this as a significant problem for our field in the future. So do you feel that that's something that's uh, here and now, Eric? Because, you know, we've looked at the growth in capitalization, $7.2 million is the, is the peak. There's a lot of capital going into the industry. We have seen clinical progress now. There's a lot happening. Do you feel that that's actually happening in a bubble and really the outside world isn't really seeing this? Because I, I do detect differently that people are picking up on this. They are picking up on it. The general public, you know, we've had you know, a number of New York Times bestsellers. So the public is fascinated by this. And this is why, and, and justifiably so. Um, but they are also, um, you know, the, sort of vulnerable to some of these outrageous claims. And I just, my point is really, um, if we want to be taken seriously by everyone, uh, you know, selling books, I mean, you're having a New York Times bestseller is great, but it's still a very small fraction of the population. And, and right, so my, my, my point is really is not that we should stop doing what we're doing. I mean, we're doing incredibly well in terms of the research and the, the, the scale of the investments is growing. So all of the, everything points in the right direction. I just I cringe, frankly, when, when I when I hear people talking about their personal data and whether they, you know, they have been rejuvenated by five years or 10 years. Uh, and then, you know, the claims of where, how long they're expecting to live is just not necessary. This is not what serious uh, scientists do. Uh, this, no one is doing this in, in, the, in the cardio field, in other field. Uh, you could say, well, our missions are, are much bigger, and, I, and they are indeed. I mean, we think we've tackled uh, something that's going to be really critical in the field. But um, I, I just, I just, I just hear, you know, the counterpart of, of our of our claims. Understood. And, you know, my, my my position here is, for example, the bucket. I mean, I'm probably more sensitive to this because I don't only represent myself. Um, I represent the whole institute, and in some way, uh, I, hopefully, you know, somewhat the voice of the field, not the voice, but one voice of the field, which is the long term voice. You know, the Buck Institute is going to be here uh, way past me. Uh, hopefully, it'll be here in 100 years, and it will be the biggest institute in the world in terms of biomedical research. And I think that's very possible. So let's think about the long-term ga game that we're playing. Uh, creating the hype is not going to help with this. Uh, seriousness is going to create. Understood. But let, let's just wrap up on some of that seriousness, Eric. I mean, you know, you're at the front line of some... Uh, amazing people that are, are are doing some incredible research, much of it very positive. Um, a lot of it's very early stage, which of course we appreciate now, but of course the industry is now starting to move on. We've got phase two trials happening out there. What are you seeing in your experiences from a scientific level that gives you actually some optimism about where we're going as an industry now? Well, I, the, the reason for the optimism is um, the fact that we are in clinical trials. Uh, and that's, you know, but also um, that's the sign of a maturing industry. And, you know, we have clinical trials ongoing on senescence. We have clinical trials going on uh, some of the nutrient sensors. We have clinical trials going into regeneration and so on. Um, but again, you know, one area where probably the biggest claims are being made is in terms of um, reprogramming, the Yamanaka factor. I mean, everyone recognizes this is a profound uh, discovery that's going to have huge implications. No one is yet to explain to me how we're going to deploy this in humans uh, yet. Uh, you know, especially, it's very easy to reprogram a cell and to slow its aging or even maybe partially revert its aging in, um, in an in individual cell population. How are you going to do this in the brain, in, in, in any organs in the humans? I haven't heard anybody explain this to me. Um, so, and, and then people conflate the two. They'll say, well, we are reverting aging. Therefore, you know, the next thing is going to happen is reversion of aging in humans. Again, uh, very interesting. But, uh, you know, there was a bit of the same hype in the, in the gene therapy field. Uh, I don't know if you remember, but about 25 years ago, there were the first vectors were discovered that were allowed us to do gene therapy. 
and all of the clans, we were going to cure all diseases. Well, what happened instead was, you know, two young patients died from, um, uh, from a cancer and caused by the vectors, and the field was put on hold for 20 years. So again, word of caution, you know, getting into humans is a whole other ball game than increasing lifespan in C. elegans or in fruit flies or in mice. Um, the other thing that I, I think is not being considered enough is the fact that you now everyone talks about the naked mole rat and what an amazing organism it is and how long it lives and, and should we study it and, and, and understand how it's doing this. Very few people understand that humans are, we are the naked mole rat of primates. We live, you know, 100, 120 year lifespan for humans is the equivalent actually of a, a 30 year lifespan for, for mole rats. So that means that humans by themselves already have engineered through evolution, a lot of protection against the aging mechanism. And the counterpart to this is actually mice are living much shorter than they should based on their, on their, on their size. So the question is then, you know, are we, are we sort of deluding ourselves by studying mice and increasing their lifespan by 30, 40% to think that we're gonna be able to do this in humans? That's my reading of the current situation of what we're gonna be doing with what we know. Now, that doesn't mean you know, that 50 years from now, um, we will be in a position to do things that are dramatically different, but I just don't see it now, frankly. Well, as you say, you know, humans aren't mice, but of course, Eric, the, as you said, identified, there are some very exciting therapies now in the clinical stage, which is which is encouraging, and we we're aware, of course, big farmers interest in in what's happening there. Uh, before we wrap up, Eric, can we maybe just talk a little bit about Azempic, um, Novo Nordisk's new new therapy that's obviously hitting hitting the market now? Um, I have spoken with people in the field, and they've identified, of course, that it's got cardiovascular support, um, and also in, in mice, it's proving to be neuroprotective. What's your view on that? So are we witnessing a, a new longevity therapy, even though it's not being claimed? to be so by its manufacturer? Yeah, absolutely. But we should also remember in what context it's been tested so far. It increases lifespan and protects against cardiovascular disease and maybe neurodegeneration in the context of people who are obese. And obesity itself is a risk factor for shortened lifespan, neurodegeneration, cancer, and heart disease. So, uh, the big question is going to be, you know, what happens when you start giving Ozempic to someone who is not obese, who's normal weight? Will you actually have any effect on longevity pathway? Uh, there's no evidence for this today. I haven't seen any evidence. Um, that doesn't mean it's not going to happen. But so when we talk about uh, uh, Ozempic being, you know, an anti-longevity drug, we should remember in what context it has been tested so far. It's a bit the same story as, uh, as uh, metformin. You know, there was some study initially, remember, that, that suggested that diabetics on, on, on metformin actually live longer. Uh, now, the quite big question, which is what the TAME trial is, is, is proposing to test, is what's going to happen when you give this to people who are not diabetics? Will, will it still have the same effect? So, again, amazing uh, discovery. Uh, it's going to make, you know, uh, Novo Nordisk probably one of the biggest pharma companies uh, in, in the world, they're projecting more than $100 billion a year of sale of this product. Um, and it's going to address one of the major uh, health problems that we see right now, which is actually in the US, probably the most responsible for the shortened lifespan that we're seeing in the last 10 to 20 years. And, and of course, the correlation perhaps with that uh, reduction in, uh, in lifespan of, of the US uh, citizens. Yes. But um, great. Well, Eric, uh, thanks for the uh, the sound reasoning. Um, I, I think it's a very interesting point that you're making, of course, a calibration point for the industry. And of course, I'm sure a lot of people will have something to say about it. So thanks for joining us today. I'm sure I look forward to the debate and uh, with anyone who wants to disagree. And uh, I think despite everything that we've said and what I've said, it is one of the most exciting field of research that, I mean, it is the most exciting I've ever been in. And it's probably even the most exciting that biomedical research has ever done. Uh, it's just a question of calibrating the expectations. And again, under promise, over deliver. Got it. Thanks a lot, Take Eric. Bye-bye.